Welcome, everybody. My name is John Clay. I'm VP of Threat Intelligence here at Trend Micro. Happy for you to join me on my monthly threat webinar series um, going on, I think it might be even seven years now that I've, I've done these. Um, this month, we're going to talk about ransomware. Obviously, a, a hot topic that's been deal, people have been having to deal with quite a bit. Uh, we're going to go into a lot of details today. A couple of case studies of a couple of, of uh, ransomware groups, how they how they attack and what they're utilizing, et cetera. Also, obviously, at the end, I'll give you some tips and ideas that can help, uh, hopefully, help you uh, minimize the risk of getting attacked with ransomware. Before we get started, a couple of items. Uh, one is if you have a question, there's a Q&A button. You can um, enter that at any time. I'll take. I'll try to answer all of those at the end of the uh, webinar. Uh, but if I don't get to your uh, question, I will respond to you via email afterwards. Uh, also, there's a resources tab. Uh, you, there's a link, couple links in there that you can get access to. Um, so why don't we get started here? First thing, uh, which I do every month in my webinars, is I want to go over some uh, month in review. So this is looking at some of the top stories that we have seen uh, over the past month. Uh, this comes from a blog that I do uh, every Friday morning. It gets published, and it kind of goes through what the week uh, had seen in cybersecurity. So whether it's stuff that Trend Micro may have uh, published or some other industry articles that are out there that I think you might be interested in, uh, just gives you that. So you can subscribe to that blog uh, and get that every every Friday. So tomorrow morning, you'll see the, the blog for this week. Uh, but a couple of things I wanted to highlight. Um, this is an interesting one. Uh, I know a lot of people uh, hopefully are aware of Sticks and Taxi. Uh, we've been actually supporting Sticks and Taxi in our threat intelligence uh, for quite some time now, but it's great to see that it was approved as, as a uh, sharing standard inside our industry. Uh, our industry doesn't have a whole lot of standards out there, so this is a good one, especially if you're looking to um, share threat intelligence or receive threat intelligence. It's, it'll be in sticks and taxi format, so which makes it a lot easier to integrate into you or upload into your system. So uh, if there's an IOC out there that is in, that, that gets published, it'll be in sticks and taxi format, which allows a lot of the, the uh, SIMs and SOARs and other um, applications to be able to pull that data very easily. So I was very happy to see that. Uh, we published an article, and we've actually been following this group. It's called Team TNT. That's an actor group uh, that has been doing a lot of cloud attacks. And so I wanted to highlight this. If you have a cloud infrastructure, it'd be a good article and report to read about because they've been very aggressive in targeting these cloud infrastructures, whether it's for cryptocurrency mining, credential theft, all of the different areas that they are doing. Uh, third one is trends and shifts in the underground end-day exploit market. This was a research project that one of our uh, researchers has had done over uh, many, many months, looking at the underground forums, underground uh, English and Russian-speaking uh, undergrounds and forums that discussed the use of uh, exploits, and in this case, end-day exploits, which are, are um, vulnerabilities that have already been patched, but they are still being used in, in exploits out there. And a lot of fascinating information in that report. I recommend you download it. In fact, I may do that a webinar on that particular research here in the upcoming months. Um, another one, main considerations for securing enterprises 5G network. So if you are looking and are actively looking to deploy 5G networks in your area, uh, great article. We actually just published a, a, a really nice and in-depth article uh, today on telecoms and 5G. So um, we're regularly sharing uh, research and information that we have around 5G and what's, what's, that, what's coming with that. And the last one is, um, if you're not familiar, Trend Micro has a, a platform called Vision One. Uh, it kind of manages a, a, all of our products and it can do a lot of, of really good threat hunting information in there. 
and we tracked cobalt strike. And I'll be talking actually later a little bit about cobalt strike and its use in, by ransomware gangs. But um, it's a good article that kind of shows in a whole investigation about tracking how cobalt strike was utilized in an attack. Uh, so a good, uh, good article to take a look at. So again, those can be found in our blog or on our security news site. Uh, but also, I pull all of these from my uh, Friday blog. So if you go back through my Friday blogs, you'll find these articles. All right, let's talk about ransomware. Uh, ransomware is certainly uh, a top of mind of almost everybody out there. Uh, we've seen the U.S. government actually elevate ransomware attacks to the status of almost uh, terrorist attacks. Uh, they are, they um the Biden administration has done a lot of things in, in terms of trying to build out uh, ransomware uh, activities inside the, the government, uh, and talking with Russia, for example, having conversations with them, talking to uh, President uh, Putin about about the challenges that we've seen with, with Russian actors. We'll talk a little bit about that, but um, but certainly ransomware is a, is a big challenge. And it's been a problem for many, many years. You know, going even back to 2010, when you look at, at, at kind of the start of when ransomware really started to, uh, to become a, a problem for organizations out there. Back then, though, it was interesting. A lot of the collaboration was through bot masters um, and ransomware actors. Uh, they utilized just some, some very uh, rudimentary um, messaging platforms that they did. The ransomware payments actually at that time were SMS, uh, a premium rate SMS numbers. So it wasn't even utilizing Bitcoin yet. Uh, payments were via e-wallets and, and alternative payment systems. But you can see here the at, uh, when you look at the price of the uh, ransomware, it was in the only hundreds or thousands of dollars. So very small ransoms at that time. And, and a lot of that was um, because it was impacted kind of locally. Uh, they weren't. They were going after more consumers at that time, and so it was the the ransoms tended to be a little bit smaller. Shift forward into like 2013. This is where we started to see the um, ransomware actors uh, starting to collaborate. Um, so you saw a lot more shifting to uh, messaging flat platforms where they could actually communicate very easily amongst themselves. These were secure platforms, so uh, hard to uh, for law enforcement to infiltrate. Um, the ransomware started to be um, uh, paid out in Bitcoins. That's, uh, we started to see Bitcoin and the cryptocurrencies starting to be utilized as, as a form of payment at that point. Um, we also at that time saw RAS, which is ransomware as a service, uh, starting to become uh, offered in the underground markets. You can see um, this was more worldwide capability. So we started to see attacks more globally in this case, instead of the local regionalized attacks. <clears throat> also, you can see here the, uh, the payments uh, were much higher at that point. We started to see them targeting more businesses as well, which allowed them to increase their, their ransoms at that time. Move over again uh, to 2016, and this is where we started to see the more APT-like activities. And uh, remember, um, during these times, we started to see breaches of organizations by sophisticated actor groups and exfiltrating data. So we saw them, and they, and they were utilizing that in extortion. So we started to see them just going after organizations' data, exfiltrating it, and then extorting that organization for that. Then we also started to see the ransomware actors here. In this case, you can see they started to build out victim databases so that they could analyze who they wanted to target. They started to get much more sophisticated tools available to them uh, to identify who they wanted to target. Um, cloud logs were starting to be utilized as well. Um, and then the use of that collaborative uh, monetization approach, right? And you can see here again, the, the ransom amounts started to grow significantly into the hundreds of, uh, hundreds of thousands of dollars. This is where we started to see really that APT mount. So instead of the mass, ex, um, uh, mass campaigns to try to hit as many people as possible, they really started to hone into organizations that they wanted to target, specific organizations they wanted to target. And then, as I was saying, you had this one group that was doing data breaches and, and stealing data. You had a different group doing the ransomware attacks. Well, now what we are seeing is obviously 
the, co the collaboration and combination of those two types of attacks against a single organization at the same time. Uh, and, and you also started to see ransomware actors uh, making tons of money to the point where they can actually now afford to uh, purchase zero day vulnerabilities and utilize those in our attacks. And we've seen that uh, in the last several months, the use of those zero day vulnerabilities in ransomware attacks. Now, you know, if you think about ransomware over the years, again, it's always going to change. It will continually change because, you know, we as a security industry are continuing to improve our ability to detect these threats. Um, you know, take an example of the uh, Kaseya attack just recently, the Revel ransomware uh, component. Um, we actually were able to detect that without any updates to our behavior monitoring and our in our machine learning technology. Um, so or so our customers were able to, to block that that last stage, which was the ransomware comp, um, inf uh, infection. It was able to stop and block that if you were using those advanced threat um, detection technologies. But they will continually change their tactics because they have to get around what the security industry is doing, the improvements that you're making as in, inside your organization to ensure you minimize that threat. We also have seen this access as a service grow uh, quite tremendously. And again, this goes with the collaboration that we're seeing improved collaboration amongst the, the criminal elements in the underground markets. Um, so you have these access as a service gangs who will do the initial access into an organization, and then they will sell that access to the different actor groups, one, one of those being a ransomware group. Um, so that's not gonna, that's gonna continue to improve and, and make things difficult. Um, they are definitely targeting more business critical systems. Um, so when they want to bring down an organization, they look, you know, they will initially um, scan that network for the business critical systems and then they'll deploy the ransomware on those systems uh, because they will take down, in, in many cases, the day to day operations of, a, of an organization. If I do that as a criminal element, I'm much more likely to get a ransom paid because that organization needs to get those systems back online very quickly. They all, we've also seen them um, living off the land a lot more, which is utilizing a lot of the legitimate tools that organizations have been using um, uh, on a regular basis out there. So try to blend into um, what's being used already inside an organization legitimately. And then last thing I do want to highlight is that ransomware is typically going to be the last revenue option. So the challenge is, is when an organization detects ransomware in their in their network, the likelihood is that that organ that as that actor group has probably been in there for quite some time already. And they've been doing activities inside there under the radar because ransomware, as we all know, once you're, you're infected, you get the pop up message and it's a very visible attack. You know, you're attacked with ransomware, whereas a lot of the other activities a lot of the other types of uh, like data exfiltration, for example, is done low and slow and it's done in to, to stay under the radar. So you don't know it's happening. So if you do get a ransomware attack, uh, you know, obviously at that point, you really have to dive into how long they've been into our into our network. What other activities have they done inside the organization and inside the network? Um, so let's, you know, I mentioned ransomware service. I just wanted to highlight a lot of people may not understand what that means. Um, so in the past, what you had is you had these um, these ransomware operators who would work with some people in, in the underground, maybe, a, you know, a spam person, a botnet, a ransomware, a bulletproof host or whatever. But they would launch the attacks directly on the victim. Now with ransomware as a service, what we are seeing is as the ransomware operators will still work with those peddlers but then they will build an affiliate um, organization, an operation. So they will have affiliates out there who will actually do the, uh, the attack on the organization. And that's what we, uh, I think, believe was the conclusion with um, the Colonial Pipeline attack is that it was probably an affiliate of the dark side group that uh, attacked that organization. And maybe they did it without the knowledge of the ransomware operator. Um, or maybe they did. It was hard. To, it's it's difficult to understand that, or hard to understand. But but that's one of the um, unintentional consequences that could happen with a ransomware as a service operation, where the operators don't really have a whole lot of say in who those those uh, affiliates target, and they could have targeted an organization like Colonial Pipeline that gives them really really bad press. 
out there and, and potentially even government action against them. So, uh, but ransomware as a service certainly is gonna continue. We're still seeing it in the underground markets. Uh, it's being offered. It does make it very easy for these affiliate groups and, and these um, actors to just um, buy the, 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 the kit and launch their attacks very seamlessly. They don't need to have a lot of the information that like the peddlers, they don't need to have access to those peddlers. They just buy the kit, the ransomware kit, and they can launch their attacks. Now there's been some shift, the key shifts and key factors in the shift towards a modern ransomware uh, attack. You can see the first is the increased computing power of machines. This has really allowed the actors to do a lot of things in the back end. So they can they can do better search capabilities. And that's kind of what the second one is, is the availability of public and private databases and automation tools. They can identify who their victims are up front. Uh, they will do their due diligence up front. They'll use the, the tools that they have available to them in the underground markets to identify who they want to target, why do they want to target them, how they want to target them, when they want to target them. All that kind of information is going to happen up front. Uh, so that's another shift that we have seen uh, doing it. And then the big one, though, is the capability to initiate anonymized high-volume cross-border money transfers using cryptocurrencies and cryptocurrency mixers. So if, if anybody may have seen some of the information about um, some of these recent uh, uh, ransomware attacks and, and you followed the, uh, the actual cryptocurrency um, component of it, they were dispersed very quickly with these mixers. And that's what the attackers are going to be doing. We're going to see more and more of these services being offered to these groups as well so that that, it's that that once they receive their cryptocurrency payment, the extortion payment, they can very quickly route that around and, and mix it around so that law enforcement and government won't be able to find them. And then the last one is the, the extensive use of communication platforms. They've gotten much better at building uh, uh, and even using some of the publicly available uh, messaging platforms that are secure, right, with end-to-end -end encryption and so forth. So it makes them their ability to collaborate amongst each other very uh, seamless. And that's why we're also seeing today, you usually don't see a single gang that launches an attack. It's multiple groups coming together and communicating together as part of the attack because now, now there's specialization in the underground, right? So you have people who specialize in certain areas like the access as a service group, they, their specialization is to get in initially into an organization, plant themselves in there and then sell that access to other groups out there. Now, when you look at the business process, and I know this is probably a bit uh, uh, detailed for you to see, but you can. Um, but you know, when you look at the at the um, at the business process, first and foremost, they're looking for asset takeover, right? Uh, asset takeover meaning getting into the organization's network, uh, and from there, they're going to do asset categorization. Now, you can see here the the different lines on the right, the legend. Um, the, the solid blue is related to the typical pre-modern ransomware process. So this is before modern ransomware started to uh, take effect. It's still utilized, but but not as as much as you can see. Now the, the the dotted blue line is the auxiliary processes that are not directly related to uh, mo ransomware monetization, but can be stages that ransomware actors go through prior to a ransomware monetization. And then the red. Uh, uh, solid is modern ransomware related monetization process and, uh, and the dotted are prerequisites. So it kind of, you kind of work through this whole thing, but you can see here again, resell for targeted attacks, resell for criminal monetization, criminal monetization of the asset and infrastructure takeover, infrastructure categorization and, and inventoryization. Uh, so again, when these actors get into your network, they will scan your entire network and, and um, categorize your network, uh, inventoryize your, your network. All of that is gonna be going on as part of an attack. Now you can see here, there, there's, sometimes there's non-ransomware monetization. Uh, which might be just, you know, let's encrypt, uh, or excuse me, let's um, let's steal data. Uh, it could be um, utilizing the resources maybe for crypto mining or something like that. There's non-victim specific ransomware monetization, which then, you know, at the very bottom, you can see here the final process is basically encrypt the files, uh, extort on the encryption, 
Um, but if they don't buy, if the customer, for example, the victim doesn't pay the ransomware uh, extortion fee, then extort on the data. And if they don't do that, then they expose the data on the internet to publicly shame that organization. We're also seeing, an, uh, and I'll talk a little bit later about it, but uh, other aspects of this to try and uh, extort the organization as well. But you can see here again, organizing alternative access to the network. So again, if I bought access into the into the organization from an access as a service broker, I wanna establish my own infrastructure to uh, gain access to that network and regularly access the network. Uh, determine the most valuable assets, uh, take over control of valuable assets, recovery, you know, et cetera, and then exfiltrate the data. And they do that first and then they will do the encryption process. So it is definitely a process here. When you look at, the, at a typical scenario here, there's a couple of ways that they're getting into an organization. And again, this, this could be an access as a service group or it could be a ransomware group that's that's targeting an organization themselves and trying to get in. But um, you know, the three areas that we're seeing most utilized is compromised accounts. So again, that credential stealing that they're doing, like RDP, for example, is huge. There, there's a lot of RDP accounts that are being bought and sold. Uh, in the underground market, and they'll do brute force attacks against your RDP, but other types of account credentials, they'll look for open IPs, et cetera, to look, do that. Spear phishing is probably still the number one way of getting into an organization, so they'll spear phish your employees with an email uh, and try to get them to click on a link inside the email or open an attachment, uh, weaponized attachment, and that gets into the infection into the employee system. But obviously, they, they very quickly move from the employee system into, the, into and laterally move uh, across the network. Uh, also, vulnerabilities, we've seen that quite often uh, as we, we spoke, uh, as we've seen, I guess, we, uh, recently, a lot of the vulnerabilities that were um, exploited uh, to get gain access to an organization. Um, but you can see here, there's uh, the initial access and then right now, ne uh, network reconnaissance and, and lateral movement. Again, this is where living off the land tools are utilized. You can see PS Exec, for example, PowerShell, Mimikatz, um, Cobalt Strike, all of these different types of tools and grayware uh, um, uh, tools are being utilized. And then data exfiltration, a lot of times through Megazinc or FileZilla. So they will, they will do the exfiltration of the data uh, and then the ransomware deployment. Um, and, and what happens in most cases now is they will terminate your current security applications that are running on those endpoints or on those systems where that data resides. Uh, and then they will be able to get uh, plant their ransomware on those systems and devices. Uh, and then they it will kick off the encryption process at that point. So this is kind of a typical scenario. It's not exhaustive, obviously. It's kind of more of a high level. Uh, we'll talk a little bit further on some of the case studies that we have. Before we get into that, though, I wanted to um, talk a little bit about why they're targeting certain areas of your organization in their infection chains. So the first area I wanted to highlight is why target credentials. I mentioned earlier, credential theft is big. First and foremost is your, your, your corporate accounts are trusted accounts in many cases, right? Your administrator accounts, they're trusted. Your employees are trusted. Now we are looking at more zero trust type of models, but, but again, in many cases, organizations trust their employees accounts. Um, and so if I can steal that, I can mimic or become that person and their activities are ten, tend to be trusted. So that makes it very difficult. Um, it allows them to disguise their activity because they are. It is a trusted account. It comes from a trusted account. For example, if if they steal an a a, a um, account credentials for an, a messaging account, email account, maybe it's your what are your execs? They could send emails from that executive's email account, and many people would receive that, thinking it is coming from that person, that trusted person. So they can disguise their activities that way. A lot of these credentials are being sold in um, in the underground, as I mentioned. There's RDP accounts all over the world that are being sold uh, to the underground actors out there, and they will do these brute force attacks regularly. The other aspect you understand is like with IoT, 
uh, all of those devices that are uh, out there today have a, a um, you know, when, it, when you install the product, it has a default uh, administrative account uh, that, it, that it comes with. And those default administrative accounts are bought and sold in the underground as well. And then lastly, a lot of people still utilize weak credentials. And so brute forcing uh, password attacks are regularly happening out there and they are re and they are actually successful because a lot of people still use very weak credentials in their um, in their accounts, uh, especially if they're not utilizing uh, two factor multi factor authentication. Well, let's look at why target people. First, it's it's much easier to target a person than do a technical attack. So, for example, instead of doing a vulnerability or an exploit, because I may have to I may have to buy that exploit or I may have to create that exploit, it's a lot easier just to fool a human. Right? Humans are very gullible. Uh, we make it very easy for ourselves for these criminals because we tend to. Um, trust things like if there it came from a trusted account, for example. Um, but it's definitely an easier attack. Uh, it's difficult to detect, um, often not reported. So, for example, if I receive an email message and I don't realize it's a phishing email, and I and I and it pops up a credential, um, you know, my Office 365 uh, um, account, and it asks me to log in. I log in, boom, and I'm done. I don't even think about it. I don't even think it, anything's wrong. So they don't they don't contact uh, IT so it's uh, and, and it makes it very difficult for IT at that point. People definitely give away way too much information, especially in the age of social media. Uh, so again, part of that that initial investigation into an organization, they're also going to investigate the people. They're going to go into LinkedIn. They're going to go into the social media channels of these people that they want to target to identify their hobbies and their what they do and how they do you know things that they like, etc. Um, so because and because people give away a lot of that information. Uh, it makes it much easier for these actors to target them with with socially engineered attacks. And then it's very low risk for high rewards. Obviously, very easy if, if I can just, you know, get into a, a, a system, an employee system, I then have a high reward because I can quickly laterally move across the network to to those other areas that are more important to that to the uh, threat actor. Now let's talk a little bit about why why are they targeting vulnerabilities first there's new vulnerabilities every single day probably every second of every day there's a new vulnerability found in some software or operating system out there um, you see that with patch tuesdays you see that you know how many patches are you receiving on a daily basis from your vendors uh, probably a lot uh, and so it makes it very easy for these uh, for these actors to exploit, uh, especially end day vulnerabilities, and that that report I mentioned earlier, um, he, I think I believe it was over fifty or sixty percent of the um, vulnerabilities requested in the underground by actors are end day vulnerabilities. So they recognize that end day vulnerabilities are easy still to utilize uh, because patching is very difficult. Organizations still, on average, take you know, many, many, many days, even weeks or months to fully patch their their systems. Again, it goes back to the number of vulnerabilities you're getting as an organization. It's nearly impossible you for you to patch all of those uh, all the time in a timely fashion. It's just a difficult process, unfortunately, for a lot of organizations. These exploit markets in the underground are propping up. Um, these end day exploits. I mean, you can if, if I am a, a criminal and I want an exploit for a my, you know, Microsoft Office application, I can go and there's probably a, a, a market just for Microsoft Office exploits. And so um, they are segmenting themselves and coming, you know, and these coders, um, uh, these these criminal coders, so to speak, um, they they specialize in certain certain types of applications, certain types of operating systems. So that makes it much easier for these actors to find what they need. And then, like I, I did mention, that zero days are starting to be bought by these criminal actor groups because they are making a lot of money out there. And and zero days are almost almost impossible to detect. Um, zero day vulnerabilities being. Uh, a, a vulnerability that does not have a patch, it's unknown out there, so they can utilize it as long as they, po as they can until that, that bug is actually uh, reported and found um, by, uh, by the good people out there. Um, so these zero-day vulnerabilities we will see continuing uh, probably in, 
and increased usage of them by a lot of these uh, malicious actor groups. And then lastly, I wanted to talk about targeting external facing infrastructure. This is an area that a lot of organizations uh, have difficulty um, uh, defending against. One, and one reason that the actors um, uh, are targeting this is they have search engines like Shodan, which scans the internet, identifies an, an, an IP, and then you can click on that IP and it'll tell you a lot of information about what's on that IP. Um, and so they can, they can utilize these tools to scan for these open IPs out there, which everybody's gonna have open IPs. You can't run a business if you don't have externally facing uh, infrastructure because you need your customers to come to your website. You need your customers to do, do some, some e-commerce type of stuff. Um, misconfigurations, unfortunately, we find are, are abound in this area where, um, you know, maybe it's secure at one point, but somebody misconfigures uh, something on that system and it opens up that system to the Internet. An example of that are S3 buckets, for example. You know, out of the box, they are secure. They're not open to the Internet. Somebody has to make a configuration change to open that S3 bucket to the internet. And once it's internet facing, it's only a matter of time, probably hours uh, or less till that has been scanned and found and the actors will take advantage of it. Uh, these exposed ports and services that are open, um, a lot of organizations don't look at, at um, uh, hardening up what ports should, should not be open, what services should not be available on the uh, uh, exposed to the internet. So organizations may need to relook at that and, and scan their, their uh, IPs. And then it's often unforgotten, um, or forgotten, I should say, uh, infrastructure. A lot of cases we've had customers that are like, we didn't realize that IP was open to the internet, um, didn't realize it, forgot about it. It's an older application or it's an old, old, older uh, system that was that was uh, open to the internet. We didn't really realize it. So, uh, and they were utilized, uh, they used that to target and get into the organization. So those are just some ways uh, that, that the criminals are targeting different organizations. I mentioned earlier about the different extortion um, uh, phases. You know, in, in the initial phase, it's the it's the ex encryption. Just in, let's encrypt, right? That's single extortion. I'm gonna I'm gonna come into the organization. I'm gonna find a, a system. I'm gonna encrypt all the files in that system, and I'm gonna and I'll pop up my ransomware uh, note that says, "Hey, I've, I've, you're a victim of ransomware. You need to pay me to get the decryption key for all the files I, I encrypted on this system or systems." That's a single extortion. Now we're seeing the double extortion where uh, prior to doing the single extortion, they will exfiltrate data to their to their infrastructure, and they will hold that. And if you don't pay the single encryption uh, or extortion, uh, they will then target you and say, "Hey, well, we stole your data. Uh, you need to pay us for the data we stole. Uh, otherwise, we're going to expose it to the uh, to the internet." So that's the double extortion. We're even now seeing triple extortion where. Uh, they also may launch DDoS attacks against your organization. So they may uh, do a DDoS attack internally. So not only do they encrypt or they steal data, but then they will DDoS your, your network as well. So again, keeping you away from business critical systems, not being able to operate those, uh, makes it very difficult for your organization. We've seen a couple of ransomware active groups utilize this techni technique. And then the last is what we're calling quadruple extortion. And this is something that Brian Krebs uh, uh, published uh, not too long ago, where um, they'll do the three, but then they, with the ex with the stolen data, they identify um, a lot of times that data includes your customers. They will then contact your customers or your vendors because they know who they are from the stolen data, and they will tell them, hey, company ABC here, um, we have their data and some of that data is yours. You need to put pressure on them to pay the, extort the, the fee so that they can get that data back. So this is now we're seeing a, 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 an era of quadruple extortion against organizations. Now in terms of timelines, this is what's interesting as well because in, like in this case that we had, um, we didn't see the ransomware 
component dropped until day 58. So they were inside this network for about two months before they actually launched their ransomware attack. Um, so it could be a very long time before you see that. And again, this is where I, I emphasize is that when you see ransomware, if you, if you get a ransomware attack and you detect it, you need to go back through and do root cause and find out when and how they got into your organization. And, and more importantly, what activities have they done prior to that? Now, there are cases like this one where day three was when they, they kicked off the ransomware. So it could be very quick. So again, it just depends on the motivation and the motives of the group that has targeted your organization. Um, it could be a very long process or it could be a very short process, but you need to be sure you can defend against both of these. I mentioned the, the living off the land, and, and when you look at the living off the land um, uh, component of it, they are using all these different legitimate tools that are being used by your current employees uh, against you. So, for example, in the, in, in the credential access, uh, initial access, they're using Mimic Cats, they're using Lasagne um, to, to harvest credentials. Uh, on the discovery side, they'll use AdFinder or Bloodhound. On the lateral movement, again, Cobalt Strike is utilized quite extensively. PS Exec is used in, uh, a tremendous amount of times by the criminals to laterally move across your organization. And then they also have defense mechanisms uh, against being attacked or being detected. So PC Hunter, Process Hacker, et cetera, are being utilized. Let's dig a little deeper into some of these. Cobalt Strike, for example, it's a threat emulation tool. Um, they'll use it for lateral movement for uh, to drop a back door. They may use it as a back door into the system. Um, has has a lot of remote access Trojan type of uh, capabilities that's associated with, with Cobalt Strike, so they'll use it there. And you can see on the far right here all the different ransomware groups that are utilizing uh, Cobalt Strike. And that's this, is, this isn't um, all of them, but it's just a good uh, um, uh, representation of them. PS Exec, I mentioned, again, executing processes on other systems. They'll use it to um, uh, arbitrarily uh, command shell execution, lateral movement inside an organization. You, again, you can see a lot of different groups that are using PS Exec. Uh, Mimic Cats, you can see here, proof of concept code for demonstrating vulnerabilities. They'll use this one for credential dumping. Um, and you can see Doppel Paymer, Nephilim, uh, Netwalker, et cetera. Uh, Process Hacker is another tool that they use um, that is legitimate uses is, is monitoring system resources, debugging software. Uh, they'll use it to discover processes or services running in the, in the network or on systems. Uh, they'll do, use it for to terminate anti-malware on systems as well. And you can see Crisis, Nephilim, and Soda Nakibi have been using that one. Um, AdFinder, or AdFind, which is an Active Directory tool. Um, they'll use it to discover your Active Directory, get information about it. Uh, and then Megasync, you can see here, is a cloud-based synchronization tool. They'll use that for um, data exfiltration. Uh, and you can see a couple of different ones. Now, um, just a reminder, um, attending today, you will receive a copy of this um, presentation. In the appendix, I'm not gonna go through the appendix later, but in the appendix, I have about six pages of these, uh, of all the different tools that are utilized. So you can, it's a pretty exhaustive list of all the different tools. And one of the things that, I, um, that we ha need to be looking at now inside our networks is the use of these tools and identifying and determining is that tool use is legitimate or illegitimate. So like, for example, if you don't use Cobalt Strike in your organization, but do you have a detection on Cobalt Strike, you probably need to look into that much more in depth and identify, is that some actor who's gotten into our network and is using Cobalt Strike? Uh, and that's where I, we, where I wanted to bring up the whole early warning area. We've been very successful working with our customers in identifying early warning uh, symptoms of ransomware because 
again, a lot of these uh, these ransomware groups, you will see early activities happening like the use of TrickBot or Emotet or Bazaar Loader or ICE-D um, or Drydex, et cetera. You'll see, if you see these detections happening inside your network, it is an early indicator that you probably will see a ransomware um, uh, malware dropped inside your network. So the nice thing about this is it gives you an opportunity to, to defend and block the ransomware component of the attack later on because you can if you can see these early warning signs that that there is an infection happening or there's a campaign against uh, an attack against my organization i have the ability to properly defend potentially against that now you can see here the double extortion that we talked about where they they're going to steal data uh, first and then they'll launch ransomware you can see here these are just a number of the different uh, ransomware groups that are already that have been utilizing double rans, uh, double extortion uh, against their victims. You can see it's not uh, an insignificant number. So a lot of these ransomware groups identified and found that these this is a very successful tactic, and they will continue to use that uh, tactic to the point where they uh, and I mentioned as we mentioned saw earlier, triple and even quadruple extortion um, uh, tactics will be utilized. Let's do a little bit into the case study um, of the a couple of case studies. Nephilim. Nephilim is a RAS operator. Uh, they they very uh, very similar to Nemty. Might have been people from that group. Might have been that group sh shifting over to, to be Nephilim. We talk about them as water rock. That's our term for Nephilim. Um, uh, but you can see here the ran the the affiliates get a 70-30 profit split. So 70% going to the affiliate, 30% going to the Nephilim operators. Um, a volume discount can be seen if you go after a high quality victim, you can actually get a 90-10 split. And that could be one of the reasons why we saw the Colonial Pipeline group attack because maybe that affiliate group thought that would be a very good high target and they'd get a higher percentage of, of payout uh, for, that, for that attack. We started to see Nephilim around March of last year. The attack lifecycle, you can see here, RDP accounts are utilized, also exploits of 2019 and even the 2017 exploit was used. Uh, they used defense evasion disabling tools. So that, again, they're living off the land using PC Hunter, Process Hacker, Gamer, Revo and Uninstaller, a BAT file. Uh, credential access, they utilized, uh, again, Mimicats, Lasagne, NatPass, um, on the discovery side, so once they were looking, they were trying to discover the, the systems, they were trying to discover the, the, um, the data that they wanted to look for. So they used a, a number of different tools there as well. On the lateral movement, add find, bloodhound, but they would terminate processes. Again, they would terminate a lot of the um, current um, security uh, applications that were running on those systems. They would drop that Nephilim ransomware but they also would exfiltrate using Megasync, Megasync um, uh, as well prior to that. Now, some of the additional information, they, the encryption would uh, target fixed drives, removable drives, and remote and network drives. Um, it avoided encrypting files with the following strings. So you see a number of different types of strings there. Interesting is Microsoft and Sophos were, were targeted in this to, to not um, avoid encrypting those, those files. It also avoids encrypting files with the following extensions. So even the .nephilim. So obviously, when they when they uh, encrypt a file, they they um, uh, put a .nephilim at the end. So they don't want to encrypt their own encrypted files. Uh, but you can see a random AES key is generated for each file, and that's what's quite interesting: is every file that they target to it for encryption would receive an AES key. Uh, and then enable that um, in the case the victim pays the ransom, the malware encrypts the, the generated AES key with a fixed RSA public key and appends that to the encrypted file. And so far, we have not seen the ability for anybody to um, un uh, decrypt their stuff. You actually would need to get that decryption key from the actors themselves in order to successfully support that. You can see here a fairly simple note um, to the actors. 
in, in most cases today, it's not going to display the ransom amount. It's going to say, contact us, and they will negotiate the ransom with you or with whoever you decide that you want to have the ransom um, uh, negotiated with. From victimology, you can see it was pretty worldwide. This group targets worldwide victims out there, um, Australia all the way to the U.S. Uh, you can also see in victimology the, the industries that they target. So, again, a very big group of industries. So this group actually is a pretty significant group. They target a lot of different groups out there globally. Um, they are a, a formidable force out there in the ransomware um, arena. Let's look at Revel and Soden Akibi. Um, you can see again in the in the initial access RDP accounts, exploits, malicious spam, and even drive bys. Um, so drive by web, um, drive by uh, compromise. So they're using as many different tools to get into the organization as possible. Uh, again, as we see saw in different places, PS Exec is used, PowerShell is used, macros are uh, macro uh, are used as well. Uh, in some cases, they'll again they'll kill AVs um, and they'll drop the Revel ransomware. In some of the um, newer uh, iterations, they again they change some tactics here. They use spam to an ice D to a Cobalt Strike Beacon to then re uh, dropping Revel with Safe Boot associated with it. Um, Kasey is probably the biggest one that we saw with the Revel group. Um, so they uh, first reported in July 2 that um, attackers used their supply chain. So they, they actually targeted uh, Kaseya. They were able to infiltrate their update process. So whenever a customer got their, their uh, updated file, they actually got infected with, with Revel or tried to get infected with Revel at that point. They demanded $70 million in payment. Um, 60 customers plus 1,500 businesses were impacted. And how it happened again? They got breached using a uh, a, a zero day vulnerability at, uh, from 2021. Um, it was a zero day at the time. Uh, the the file was the Kaseya VSA hot, agent hot fix is what they utilized um, to download into the uh, the victim system, and it disabled Windows Defender upon execution. So again, they looked to. Um, stop a lot of the security software that was running. But again, I mentioned earlier, if our our customers who are running our behavior monitoring technology and our and our um, machine learning scanning technology, we actually blocked the uh, Revel ransomware from from uh, executing on those systems. Now the gang itself was a, a it was a RAS operation. Um, for, for ransomware evil, also known as Soden Akibi, um, active since May of 2020. Um, they they did publish information to their happy blog page um, to try and entice Kaseya and the, and the victims into pain. Uh, they recruited affiliates to distribute. Uh, notable targets, you can see G JBS was another one of their um, victims that, that apparently paid quite a significant amount for it. Um, and the primary members are thought to reside in, in Russia, um, not confirmed, but, uh, but we also um, have seen probably no connection to the Russian government. Now, everybody hopefully saw that they closed shop, which is good. Um, they aren't committing the crimes, well, at least under the Revel name. Maybe they're going to be a different group now moving forward. But also, uh, you probably heard that the uh, somehow Kaseya was able to um, obtain the decryption key, the, the global decryption key. So they've been distributing that to the victims out there. And hopefully all those victims can now get their systems back online if they haven't already. The last one I wanted to highlight is CLOP. Um, this was a uh, back in 2019. Again, they were using spear phishing emails. They used a rat. They used Cobalt Strike. Um, they dropped uh, uh, the CLOP ransomware uh, on systems there. Uh, newer iteration, they were using an HTML document uh, that dropped a loader, uh, SD bot, and then it dropped CLOP ransomware. And then the last one recently, we've seen them utilizing. Um, uh, exploits of, of 2021 vulnerabilities that were found this year. Uh, FTA application tools is a compromise tool. And then they also were doing double extortion. So they did the data exfiltration through do mode and they would then drop the, the, the clop ransomware. 
Uh, it's tied to the TA505 group. So if you want to look up TA505, there's some uh, some information about them. Some members <clears throat> were, were arrested in Ukraine, although we, the, the speculation is a lot of those were maybe some of the mules or some of the affiliates. Um, uh, we saw new attacks one week later. So the likelihood that the actual group itself got um, uh, arrested is, is highly unlikely. It was probably some, some people working with them. Uh, it is. It does appear to be a ransomware as a service. Uh, noble, notable targets are very large organizations around the world. International enterprises is who they're targeting. Uh, and again, the primary members are thought to reside in Russia. Um, so let's talk about uh, best practices. So one thing, you know, this is a hot topic about uh, do you pay or not pay? Right. Some just some reasons of why not to pay. One, there's probably there is no guarantee that the, that you're going to get your files back or your, or the decryption key. So think about it. If they steal your data and they go, well, pay us an extortion fee and we'll give you that data back. You don't think they're going to have a backup copy of that data? Um, it's highly unlikely, uh, but maybe again, part of their uh, the the thing is is that's part of the business model is that if they if they get known as a group that goes back on their word, uh, they likely won't get paid in the future. Uh, paying the ransom obviously funds further criminal operations. They're able to, again, buy new zero-day exploits because those aren't cheap. Uh, so they use those funds to buy that, buy infrastructure, buy uh, access to other, uh, other groups, et cetera. And then knowing that a victim will pay makes them a much more attractive target. So the, the uh, there's been some studies that show that if you are known to pay the ransom, uh, then you will be targeted uh, a lot more by other groups because they are they know that you are going to pay the ransom and not. Now, with all this said, obviously every organization is going to have to determine um, the right way to go about it. Um, cybersecurity might or uh, insurance may help in terms of paying for that, although that whole uh, industry is going through a, an upheaval because of the amount of ransoms they've had to pay. And so the likelihood is you're going to see increased um, increases in, in uh, insurance payments. Uh, but in any case, um, everybody's going to have to decide what they can do now. Some things you can consider. Uh, you can see this. Uh, this is a great site for you to take a look at. Um, I mentioned the U.S. government is doing a lot of activities around this. This is a new page that they created to help organizations um, stop ransom. Where.gov uh, you can go to. Nomoreransom.org is also an area where if you, you can maybe be able to find a decryption key. Uh, we support that as well as many of the other uh, our peers in the industry. Uh, but some of the frameworks uh, you you know use uh, look at and utilize some of these common security frameworks. So CIS uh, um, Center of Internet Security has some good frameworks. Uh, NIST has some really great frameworks that you can utilize. Uh, obviously, under NIST, it's you know the process really audit and inventory. I mentioned those open IPs, audit and inventory your organization. The criminals are going to do it for uh, uh, for themselves. Once they get in, they're going to audit and inventory your your network. You should be doing that yourselves. Configure and monitor. Configure your systems properly. Monitor what is going on into the in the organization. Patch and update. Uh, protect and recover. Uh, secure and defend as much as possible. And then train and test. Uh, so test your your ability to do it. You know, look at your um, incident response plan. P train your employees properly. Test your incident response plan of an uh, you know simulate a ransomware attack that your your critical systems have just been taken over and, and are able to be accessed. How do you defend against that? How quickly can you respond to it? How quickly can you recover from it? Some of the best practices, again, backing up files, use the 321 uh, rule, three backups, two different formats, one stored off site. Harden your administrative accounts. You know, multi factor authentication, two factor authentication, your, especially your administrative account. Those are critical accounts that, that have that trusted uh, access. They, they have a lot of power associated with them. That's what they're going to target. Uh, enable the advanced detection capabilities. Disable PowerShell if you can. PowerShell, I mentioned earlier, is used a lot. 
Uh, also, I mentioned all those living off the land tech um, tools. Monitor those tools. Um, limit the exposure, granting users, you know, um, you know, uh, system components privilege, uh, privilege access, right? Uh, access privileges. Minimize what access your your um, your employees have access to, what systems they have access to. Even your administrators, make sure that they have access only to those systems they should be uh, uh, contacting. Consider blocking access to ports that enable file sharing. Because again, that's a lot of cases, that's how they um, propagate and drop their ransomware uh, is through those uh, file sharing capabilities. And then cultivate a, ser a security aware culture. Human error is, is still one of the key tactics that cyber criminals look for. So whether it's a human error of an employee uh, or a human error of an administrator making a, a configuration change, et cetera. Uh, perform phishing re uh, simulations regularly uh, to, a, to train your, your uh, employees to identify phishing attacks. That definitely helps. And then develop a corporate-wide security awareness training program and run it regularly. We just got through our, our round of security awareness. I had to go through it. Everybody has to go through it. Had a, lo a lot of great simulations that we, we were able to, to utilize and had to go through uh, to help identify how these attacks work and, and how we can stop them. Some of the advanced detection capabilities, AI and ML, so artificial intelligence, machine learning, if you have, if your products have access to them, uh, utilize them, enable them. If they don't have them, talk to your vendor. Maybe they have a newer version out that you can, that, ha that does take advantage, or maybe look at a vendor who does have that capability. Those are very proven technologies in detecting zero hour threats. Vulnerability shielding or virtual patching. So again, we talk about patching is hard virtually patch uh, it, uh, and that gives you the time to take the time to, to, to ensure that that full patch works. Uh, spear phishing protection, your messaging layer, look for products that have spear phishing protection. A lot of them come now with AI and, and, and machine learning capabilities that can detect a lot of these phishing uh, uh, emails. Command and control traffic detection. So again, they're gonna establish a command and control infrastructure inside your organization so that they continually have access. If you can identify that command and control infrastructure, you can block their access. A custom sandbox. So if you have suspicious files, drop it into a custom sandbox and customize it to your environment because in a lot of cases, they may write malware that only runs in your environment, not in others. Uh, and then lastly, lateral movement detection. So some network scanning that you can identify that lateral movement because it will happen. Uh, some of them, uh, I'm running out of time here. I just want to go through micro segmentation can help with that uh, lateral movement as well. And then, you know, um, if you want to talk to us, we'd love to chat with you about our cybersecurity platform. This platform allows you to um, uh, improve your detection to through a XDR solutions, through our Vision One platform that allows us uh, a much better visibility and control against these attacks that go across your entire network. We support Sticks and Taxi, as I mentioned earlier, so a lot of that capabilities, but we'd love to talk to you about that. Um, Trent's been in business for many years, and next steps, you can contact us. So I'm gonna turn it over to uh, Q&A now. I know I only have a few minutes here, but uh, let's see if we can't answer some of your questions. Are you able to share some of your security awareness training content? Um, Bill, let me look into that and see if that's something we we could share with our customers or with uh, people out there. I'll get back to you on that. MS Defender has tamper protect protection. How come it was disabled? Well, again, um, these tools in a lot of cases have the capability of, of doing what it's supposed to do. In a lot of cases, they're utilizing the administrative controls, uh, getting the administrator control who administers your, your Microsoft Defender. So then they will then um, get into the console where your where Defender is managed and they will turn off things like that. <clears throat> Are we seeing slow data drain or is an uptick in ISP internet traffic a good indicator? They're gonna go slow. They're gonna go slow with the data um, because again, they don't wanna show you that there's this massive amount. You'll see that, you'll be able to detect that. So in many cases, it's low and slow. They'll also utilize a lot of the tools that you're already using. If you're a Dropbox customer, 
they'll use Dropbox, right? If you're a box customer, they'll use box. I mean, all of those things they're, they're going to use um, uh, to try and hide themselves in the, in the traffic you're using. Uh, is Vision One configured to find these applications by default, or does it have to manually configure to do so? Uh, it depends on what you're looking for. Vision One does have some capabilities into um, sweeping your your uh, data for uh, detections on stuff. Uh, in a lot of cases, some of the tools that we talk about um, may be detected by us, but we may not show them as malicious because, again, we don't know if it's a legitimate use or, a, or a, a malicious use. So we'll, we may flag it, but then you're going to have to do the due diligence on identifying is it malicious or is this a malicious use or not. Uh, cryptocurrency, the primary money transfer method for ransomware ta attackers? Ab absolutely. Absolutely. It is uh, Bitcoin is the, is the dominant one. We are starting to see some of the other currencies being utilized. But crypto is definitely the way to go for these actors because, again, in most cases, uh, the, the whole reason that cryptocurrency is used because it's, um, it, is, it is encrypted <laughs> and it's difficult for uh, groups to see. Do you have an inventory of all ransomware that hits this year? What came, of, uh, what came that month? So um, we do publish in a lot of cases the new ransomware um, uh, families that we have seen each month. So we're going to be publishing our first half report at the end of August. In that report, you'll see, um, at least through June, all of the new ransomware families that were introduced each month. Um, let's see. I think that's all we had so far. Oh, here's one. How is da the data backed up, and are we confident that backups remain unaffected by ransomware infection? Yeah, good question. Um, uh, well, again, you have to look at your your current backup process. Um, and again, you know that three, two, one. One of the reasons is the one is is to store it offline because in many cases the ransomware actors, as part of the encryption process, will target backup files. So if your files are are on the network. They will find those and encrypt those as well. So that's why we recommend having at least one offline or off-site type of backup. Uh, I think that's all I had for questions. I know we're a, a few minutes over. Again, we we will we do record this. It will be on demand. So if you have employees or if you have peers that you think would uh, help with the uh, seeing this. Um, this uh, on-demand version, uh, then you can send them that link and you will receive that link as part of the uh, follow-on email to you, as well as a link to where you can get the, um, uh, the slides. And like I said, there's an appendix that has a list of all the tools that we have seen being used maliciously by actors out there. And it's like I said, it's six or seven pages full of it. So there's a lot of them being used. So, um, uh, if pre-ransomware activity is detected, would attempt to clean them up, set off alarms. What do, what do you see? I mean, you're gonna you, you you may alert the actor group that's inside your network that you have found them, but you need to do that. You know, <laughs> uh, unless you want to, unless you want have a capability of monitoring them and not letting them go into destructive areas, um, which you know, or maybe drop them into a uh, an area of your network that you can monitor them and, and fool them, but. Um, but in many cases, you want to get, you want to identify it, and you want to get them out of your network as soon as possible. So, um, thank you very much. Uh, I'm going to turn it uh, over here. Um, look forward to talking to you again next month. I will be announcing the the subject here sh soon. You'll see that. Um, but thank you for joining me today. I hope this was helpful. Have a great rest of your day, and please stay safe and healthy. Bye bye.